Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And the Ocean Wind Project by Orsted and PSEG, committed to the creation of a new long-term sustainable clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Hello, and thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, in for Brianna Venosi. There's a new vaccine mandate from the Murphy administration. Governor Murphy signing an executive order requiring that any workers employed under a state government contract must also get vaccinated against COVID-19 or face weekly testing. The governor also said today that the state is moving forward with plans to vaccinate children against COVID as the number of school-based outbreaks rise with another 30 outbreaks last week. New Jersey has seen a total of 126 outbreaks since the start of the school year. Federal regulators are expected to approve vaccines for younger children soon, and the Biden administration announced today that it has obtained enough doses of Pfizer's COVID vaccine to inoculate all of the five to 11 year olds in the country. Rather than using mass vaccination sites, doctors, pharmacies, and clinics will be called on to vaccinate children. Meantime, as we await decisions from regulators on Moderna and J&J &J boosters, the big question is, will there be a rush to get them? While nearly 6 million residents are fully vaccinated, so far only a minority of those eligible for boosters have rolled up their sleeves. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan looks at what's behind the hesitation. It's a no-brainer. I mean, why wouldn't you? Susan and Morris Donovan each got a third Moderna shot today at an Essex County vaccination site. They're eligible under a CDC advisory that issued a list of qualifying medical conditions. It's not technically a booster, but that's how many people see it. I do have an underlying condition, but um, I'm doing it also just to get a third dose for more insurance. I want to protect myself, I want to protect my family, and I want to protect other people and hopefully get rid of this awful scourge of a virus. People I know have come in and just walked in. I made an appointment to make sure I was eligible. Most folks who come here for COVID shots want either a third Moderna dose or a Pfizer booster, but they haven't rushed to line up for jabs. Even after the CDC recommended Pfizer boosters for anyone over 65, people with certain medical issues, or workers in especially high-risk jobs, only about 20% of New Jerseyans eligible for Pfizer boosters have actually gotten one. Well, I think there is some hesitation. I don't think there needs to be. I think the risk, as we can see it right now, is exceedingly small. The benefits are real. But Rutgers' Dr. Lewis Nelson says with messages swirling from the FDA, the CDC, and the White House, people aren't sure about which vaccine to boost or when. There is daily news reports about how different advisory groups are making different recommendations. Uh, the one thing that is clear is that people who are older or people who have underlying immunologic diseases, um, things like diabetes or certain cancers are at higher risk. Those people do seem to benefit from getting an additional dose of the vaccine. There's no question it's confusing. That's why it's hard for me when I put out a message. We got to go over and over it because things change very quickly. Essex County officials say if federal regulators update rules to also approve boosters for both Moderna and J&J &J vaccines, it could open floodgates here at least, where Moderna was a very popular option. We did about 300,000 individuals to 400,000 just Moderna. So those are they're going to be qualifying for that. So it's definitely going to increase our numbers. We're ready for them. Our nurses, our registration staff is ready. Meanwhile, booster options for J&J &J vaccine recipients who thought they'd be one and done could expand from just another dose of J&J &J to include boosters of either Pfizer or Moderna. It's called the mix and match proposal. Federal regulators who initially felt reluctant about mix and match can now refer to a new study conducted by the National Institutes of Health. It suggests that original J&J &J recipients 
could benefit more from Moderna or Pfizer boosters than getting an additional dose of J&J. &J. And if the science says you need an extra shot, then go ahead and get an extra shot. That's going to be the advice. Uh, we are anticipating that all three of the uh, vaccines that are available for United States citizens will require extra dosing. I didn't know you can mix. Mix and match, mix right. And match. So I didn't know about that one. So I have to do more study on that one before I do that. Nurse Marie Durellian, who got a J&J &J jab, plans to choose a booster. She's still trying to convince others. One of her unvaccinated friends is now hospitalized with COVID and very sick. He's only 25 years old. It's not a joke. The coronavirus is not a joke. People need to understand, put politics aside, and then come and take the vaccine. In West Orange, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. For more on boosters, check out Lilo Stainton's article on njspotlightnews.org. There's a political dispute in Trenton over a major public safety issue. City officials are sparring over how to pay for the city's emergency radio and phone systems. Trenton's 911 system is at risk of being shut off at the end of the month, and the city council won't authorize the payment of an outstanding bill. Meantime, the mayor wants to use millions of federal COVID relief funds to pay for upgrades to the system. The bickering over what to do comes at a time when crime is on the rise in Trenton. Raven Santana has the story. And then this spot is the secondary backup to uh, all fire department in case there's a fire. Trenton Police Captain John Zappley says come October 31st, emergency responders may have no way of communicating with each other if the city's 911 radio system is shut down. That nightmare could become a reality in a little over a week if the city council doesn't approve a measure to resolve the issue. We've had some lapses with our current service provider. Council has made it clear that they don't want to continue, but they also don't want to pay them either. So our current provider is going to shut off the service um, October 31st. Trenton Mayor Reed Gussiora says the city currently owes the service provider MPS Communications $200,000 for its services. However, Trenton City Council has indefinitely tabled a resolution to pay the bill. That's why the vendor is now threatening to shut down the entire radio system. We do have a solution. The county has offered us to use their 911 emergency transmission airwaves at no cost. All we have to do is buy the equipment that is compatible with the county's 911 system. So we're asked council to authorize up to $4 million in American recovery funds. This will be at no cost uh, Trenton taxpayers since the county will pay for the air frequency and ARP will pay for the radios themselves. Council president unfortunately pulled that resolution from consideration tonight. So we're boxed in where they're not authorizing us to continue with the current provider, but not letting us take a new one up either. The lack of support for emergency responders couldn't have come at a worse time. Last year, the city experienced a record number of homicides. To date, this year, there have been 30. The other big problem is either A, police officers cannot talk amongst one another in case they're in trouble, and as well as fire department personnel won't be able to converse in a fire scene. God forbid someone's trapped in a fire and they're in a certain location in the house. How are they going to get members there to extract them? Zappley says over 80,000 Trentonians could be put at risk now that the center needs to be moved onto a backup channel that he says isn't meant for extended use. The police will go on a backup channel. The fire department will go on a backup channel. The rest of the city entity, meaning public works, inspections, water, sewer, they will have no radio communications whatsoever when that happens. The city council is divided on the issue. East Ward Councilman Joe Harrison plans to walk on a resolution to allocate $4 million for 911 upgrades. We've had the last couple of weeks, we have fires on Broad Streets, we've had shootings, we've had people who have gotten stabbed. What's behind all this since you're, you, you sit on that council? Uh, there's been too much arguing, too much fighting, uh, too much uh, grandstanding. We did reach out to Council President Kathy McBride for an interview but she declined and instead provided this statement. 
If there is a danger presented to the city of Trenton, its residents and visitors, it is specifically and completely because of the failures of Mayor Reed Gossiora. Our emergency first responders have been working with a subpar system under the mayor for four years, which has failed several times before the expiration of the MPS contract. This issue did not just arise this past month, and our first responders deserve a state-of-the-art system. That system was detailed in a professional report paid for by the city of Trenton and ignored by Mayor Gossiora. The next chance to break the political stalemate will come on Thursday night's city council meeting. For now, the future of Trenton's 911 system remains unclear. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. New Jersey has worked to shrink its prison population in recent years, but those efforts have not ended the troubling racial disparities that exist behind bars. A new report finds black residents are incarcerated here at a rate of 12 and a half times that of white residents. That is the worst rate in the nation. So why does that disparity still exist even after the state's efforts at reform? Melissa Rose Cooper has our story. Because prisons are naturally out of view, they're designed to be out of view, we as a society can forget that, you know, what, who's there and for how long. But Ashley Nellis, senior research analyst with the Sentencing Project, says New Jerseyans should know where their tax dollars are going, especially when it comes to who is being placed behind bars. The advocacy group releasing a new report that finds New Jersey incarcerates black people 12.5 times more than white residents, the highest in the nation. For New Jersey, it's sort of a it's a mixed bag because it's a state that has had tremendous decarceration, about 38, 39 percent drop in its state imprisonment um, over the last uh, 10 15 years or so. Overall, there's been a change in uh, the number of Black people, a drop in the number of Black people who are incarcerated in New Jersey. There's still this uh, very troubling disparity between Blacks and whites in the state. A disparity that hasn't changed much since the sentencing project's last report in 2016. When you're living in a state that is amongst one of the most segregated in the nation, in a state where uh, the racial wealth gap is amongst the widest in the nation. It's absolutely no surprise that those same disparities would be in the prison because what drives prison conditions is the desperation and the hardships in the community, which ultimately leads to the desperation that leads to crime. We need to do a drastic overhaul for our sentencing policy. We took a few good steps towards reducing mandatory minimum sentencing application, but we need to end all mandatory minimum sentences. We need police accountability. Um, New Jersey is behind in police uh, disciplinary transparency. 29 other states have better disciplinary transparency practices than New Jersey, so we need to catch up. State lawmakers did take some action in response to the Sentencing Project's 2016 report. A new law was adopted requiring criminal justice bills to include racial impact statements to see what kind of effect legislation would have on communities of color. But advocates, including Assemblyman Benji Wimberly, who sponsored the bill, say it's not being done. We have to get to the point that enough is enough. And we need people to speak up. It's not it's not good enough for people to say, oh, I agree with you. We need, you know, white people. We need people of, you know, different religions. We need people of different colors to step up and say, look, enough is enough. Those laws that were put in place largely in the 1980s and 90s during a very um, understandable crime rise and infestation in communities of the crack epidemic. Those drug laws that were put in place that were not research-based, but were fear-based, those have been difficult to reverse. Advocates are hoping the recent findings of continued racial disparities will push lawmakers to address state policies so meaningful change can be made. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. The top of the ticket is getting all the attention this election season, but there are a handful of New Jersey's legislative districts that are also attracting attention. Senior political correspondent David Cruz takes a look at the second legislative district Senate race which is proving to be the most expensive campaign in the state. It's hard not to look at Atlantic County without viewing it through the prism of Atlantic City. AC is the economic engine, a workplace for thousands of residents and a source of millions of dollars in tax revenue and other economic activity. The two men looking to replace departing Senator Chris Brown 
agree only that it's a big issue, not so much on the job the governor's done to prop it up after four years and four more forthcoming of state control. The city has unfortunately got major challenges. You know, it has been 43 years since resorts opened. I was seven years old. And there are parts of that city that look worse now than ever. And there's crime over there. We need more police and we need it cleaned up. And so the city has got some significant challenges. They want to look at legislatively grants. I provided a $35 million grant for bars and restaurants uh, to help them. Actually, the, we had the governor come down and we, and we uh, had a press conference on that. And other things, $120 million for, for micro businesses. The second district is in South Jersey, never especially hospitable to Governor Murphy, but Democratic registration is up down here. They make up 38 percent of the voters compared to 27 percent for Republicans. But it's the unaffiliated who make this a district where the senator is a Republican, but the assembly members are Democrats. As for where the district stands on who's at the top of the ticket, John Frungen of the Hughes Center for Public Policy at Stockton University says it's a mixed bag. South Jersey people support Governor Murphy's vaccine mandates and mask mandates. Uh, they were very unhappy along the shore uh, with our tourist economy that it took so long to reopen the businesses. And so there may be some lingering resentment over that. Uh, but the Democrats uh, certainly have some advantages, and one of them is money. It looks like they have a two-to-one advantage in fundraising right now. And that's not counting the outside money from independent expenditure groups, which will make this the state's most expensive legislative race. And that's not always a good thing. Ironically, something both sides agree on. Well, I think we all wish we could limit it and somehow just so you could have real campaigns and talk about real issues and not have all this extraneous stuff that just distracts people. But again, that's not the world we live in right now. It is what it is and you have to deal with it. I have no control of them, first of all. And I said, second of all, if there's oversaturation, people come up to me either in a store or if I knock on doors and they said, you know, I seen this ad, it was pretty negative about your opponent or whatever. And, you know, you can't, you have to say that, you know, these are independent expenditures and, and, you know, we have no control over. Mazio says he'll challenge his party when he needs to, criticizing the governor in the past on slow casino reopenings and the closing of NJ Transit's Atlantic City line. Polistina, backing Republican Jack Cittarelli, says he hopes for a more collaborative relationship with the governor, which you expect to hear from a Republican when, regardless of the outcome here, Democrats are expected to run both houses again next year. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. A string of prominent Democrats have come to campaign for Governor Murphy in recent weeks. And last night, GOP challenger Jack Cittarelli got his own high-profile visitor in the form of Republican National Committee Chairwoman Ronna McDaniel. She criticized Governor Murphy for New Jersey's high taxes and unemployment adding that Murphy is shaking in his boots over the upcoming election. With election day less than two weeks away and early voting beginning this Saturday, voter registration could play a big role in who emerges victorious in this governor's race. Unaffiliated voters once outnumbered both Democrats and Republicans, but for the first time last year, registered Democrats became the dominant voting bloc. I spoke with NJ Spotlight senior projects editor Colleen O'Day about how that might play out in the governor's race. Colleen, how significant is this shift in voter registration numbers and how potentially will it impact Jack Cittarelli? You know, so it, it really was not that long ago that New Jersey had a fairly balanced uh, balanced registration between the Democrats and Republicans. Um, you know, it wasn't until recent years that the Democrats have really pulled away. There's more than 1 million more Democrats than there are Republicans. And, and that's really a problem for Jack Cittarelli because he's got to not only motivate all of the Republicans to come out and vote for him, but he also has to motivate a substantial number of 
unaffiliated voters. We've got lots of them, more than, you know, about two and a half million, um, you know, or try to, you know, sway some Democrats to come over. Uh, so it's the, the math is really not in his favor. So what was behind the shift in the change in voter registration numbers? What caused this? So, you know, what, what really helped was way back when, when uh, Barack Obama uh, first ran for president, he made a conscious effort really across the nation to try to register more folks. And that was kind of the start, the first uptick in democratic registration in the state. You know, and then we've just seen it happen in, in kind of dribs and drabs over time. Uh, Governor Murphy, before he was governor, when he was running, uh, put some money behind that effort. Uh, New Jersey also is doing, um, you know, automatic voter registration now. So people are kind of thinking right away, well, you know, who do I want to be? And so as the state has grown bluer demographically as well with, um, you know, this, some folks have moved out of state. They tended to be more of the Republicans. The folks moving in tended to be more Democratic. It's just kind of snowballed. So it sounds like there's going to have to be a real thoughtful uh, strategy, I guess, from the state GOP moving forward, given that the numbers aren't in their favor. Yeah. And, you know, they've they've had problems because they they don't hold the state house or either um, office, you know, either the Senate or the assembly. They haven't won a, a U.S. Senate seat in New Jersey in decades. So there hasn't really been a standard bearer or somebody to go out there and do the, the kind of legwork that you need to really, you know, boost voter registration, uh, get more money coming into the party. Um, so they're, they're, they're kind of in a rebuilding phase. And um, again, that, that's kind of hurt Jack Chitterelli. They need somebody to do that work. And until they get somebody to do that work, then they're not gonna have the numbers. You know, again, it's, it's, it's difficult. Colleen, thanks. Thank you, Rhonda. For many of us, the office is still our kitchen table. And even for those who've gone back to the office, it may not be five days a week. So what is happening with New Jersey's commercial real estate market? Like the workplace itself, it's undergoing a transformation. Leah Mishkin looks into the future of work and the state's real estate footprint for tonight's Spotlight on Business report. The return back to the office is a process companies are figuring out in real time. We've let the genie out of the bottle. The footprints are changing. They may come into the office three days a week or two days a week, but then they'll work at home for, uh, for the remainder of the week. So I don't think that demand for office is going to be what it once was. Rutgers University professor James Hughes says that means the most up-to-date office spaces will be used the most. New Jersey's Commercial Real Estate Development Association CEO says amenities to incentivize employees to want to go back to the office. Think Facebook and Google offering free food, relaxation rooms, and coffee shops. Those that didn't put as much time and effort investment monies into their portfolio are having a much harder time. Those office uh, owners, developers that have invested some significant monies over the years in their technology, in their amenities, in their upkeep and maintenance are doing quite well. Because one of the other trends besides working from home uh, is working near home. So we see some satellite offices uh, utilizing existing office buildings to set up small suites of spaces near where clusters of employees live. Hugh says in the past year or two, obsolete office buildings have been torn down to make room for fulfillment centers, large warehouses, a booming industry which exploded with the advent of e-commerce and has continuously been trending upwards, he says. I've just taken down a 100,000 foot office building in Piscataway, New Jersey, and I'm building 100,000 square feet of uh, warehouse distribution. And we are under siege with offers. The chairman and CEO of the Sudler Companies, a private real estate development company, says they have demolished virtually every office building they own to turn into industrial warehouse distribution, including a 500,000 square foot office building in Cranberry before the pandemic. It was originally built for the Continental Insurance Company, and then they, when they were absorbed, it became Prudential Insurance. When those leases expired, 
we were unable to lease that building. We built nearly a million feet of industrial space where the office building stood. The space was leased immediately, even before it was completed. I think the future is for office space is somewhat dim. That's not to say that there won't be an office market. There will be, but it's going to be a different market. Next year, 2022, we'll be seeing a testing out of all these alternative models. Whether that's return to office, work from home, work near home, or a combination. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Leah Mishkin. Now here's a look at how the stock market fared today. Support for the Business Report provided by New Jersey Monthly Magazine, covering all of New Jersey, what to do, where to go, and so much more on local newsstands and online at njmonthly.com. And that does it for us this evening. Remember to catch Chatbox with senior correspondent David Cruz on Thursday. David discusses the lawsuit that seeks to desegregate New Jersey schools how the pandemic has further exposed the issue of equal access in the classroom and what can be done to improve opportunities for students across the state. That's Thursday at 6.30 p.m. live on our NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. I'm Rob DeShapler. Have a great night. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association, the PSEG Foundation, and by the Pew Merchants Association of New Jersey and Smart Heat NJ. Day after day, we rely on electricity for all the ordinary things in our lives and for the extraordinary. Mom! Hey, sweetie, how are you? So, tell me about the game. I scored two goals. That's my boy. At PSEG, our commitment to you now is more powerful than ever.